uh, starting in verse 8, how not to be taken by uh, captive by philosophy. And uh, I, I do know it's Mother's Day, but we are continuing on in Colossians, so there's definitely uh, some overlap, <laughs> overlap here. Uh, but anyway, I'll open us in prayer, and then we will get into... Uh, Colossians 2. Um, but uh, I will say that while uh, I'm sure all of you moms are great, I think my mom stands a, a cut above the rest. <laughs> I got in an argument once with a kid uh, in Awana that I just remembered sitting here years ago. We argued about whose mom was, was the best. So <laughs> I think I won. But <laughs> I don't know. I, still, I don't remember who it was. But uh, anyway, so <laughs> but anyway let's, uh, let's open in a word of prayer and we will get into uh, Colossians. Colossians 2. Lord God, we thank you for Christ, as we just sung about, that you have sent us a great Savior who is God in the flesh, that who has forgiven sin, who has made a new heart, who has triumphed over, over death, death and sin and evil in this world, and he is high above all rule and authority, Lord, and that you not only did those things on our behalf, but you united us with Christ, in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Lord. So we pray that we would not be satisfied with artificial substitutes, that you would uh, keep us grounded, stable, that we would, as we've received Christ, that we would walk in him, that we would not be taken captive by philosophies pretending to be true or something outside of Christ while not clinging to him who's the foundation for all those things, Lord. And Lord, we just pray that you would impress those things upon our hearts and mind, that we would go out to the world with confidence in uh, the gospel of a great salvation and a great Savior centered around your Son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So we're in Colossians 2, and I wanted to uh, open by just reading Colossians 2.8, leaving off of where Mr. Moore left us off last week of that command in this verse of after talking about Christ as the foundation that in him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And that's his primary conviction and thrust of this whole chapter. He commands that the people uh, that to whom he's writing, as you've received Christ, Walk in him, be stable, be grounded according to the faith, according to truth, overflowing with gratitude. And then he gives a warning. What is going to threaten that knowledge of growing in Christ, of being complete in Christ? Well, in Paul's mind to the particular Colossians situation, listen to Colossians 2.8 and uh, follow along with me. Uh, Colossians 2.8, Paul writes, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of this world, rather than according to Christ. For in him it, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. And it goes on beyond that, to talk about the union with Christ, the salvation that provides of our, our death in Christ, our, our resurrection to new life, a new heart, full forgiveness of sins that's described in detail in this chapter. And so Paul is worried that the Colossians, to whatever extent, he knows if they're saved, that they're saved, but he's worried that they will be taken captive. So he gives a very strong command that if you want to know in the Bible and the New Testament, a strong command, they usually start it with see to it. This is something of uh, primary importance. It's a, it's a warning that you have to take note of. And so he starts it this way, the see to it that no one takes you captive, that no one kidnaps you, no one captures you through these ideas, these philosophies, these things that sound plausible on the surface, these elementary principles of the world that make some sense but are not true, that are not what God values, that are against what God says, or the idea that there is something outside of Christ also necessary that you're missing 
just by following Christ, knowing him through his word, that there's some sort of missing tradition or that there's some sort of philosophical idea that, uh, that is greater, that gives greater truth, greater clarity. And so Paul, just remembering the theme of Colossians, is that Paul is focusing, he's taking the opportunity to take the chance to say that since Jesus is God's appointed head, Jesus is God, Jesus is the creator, uh, he is the one who God sent into the world to be the head not only of physical creation, but spiritual creation and his work to save and his creation of the church and his salvation of the church and that he is the head of that body and that the believer is in Christ and that to the believer, Christ is everything. Jesus defines everything. We define everything relative to Christ. As, as Paul will say in Colossians 3.11, he will say Christ is all and in all. And so there are different threats at this time to the, the Colossians as uh, there's the developing ideas of Gnosticism, which they claim they have these secret ideas, that we have secret uh, apostolic tradition that the apostles didn't tell you about. We have secret other ideas about who God really is, who Jesus really is, what it really means not to have uh, salvation, but to have true knowledge. There's philosophical systems. There are uh, ascetic systems. There's other religious systems that have their, their traditions or these ideas of uh, the kind of blend mysticism or you have visions or somebody has a, a word from God uh, or people uh, treat their bodies very harshly or these different things that they say are truth that you, yes, Jesus, but Jesus and this other stuff. And so there's this threat, and it, it diminishes the sufficiency of Jesus' person and his work. And so Paul uh, warns them, see to it that no one mugs you. No one steals your wallet, so to speak. And so we'll look at this first point here of uh, what I, for Colossians 2.8. Uh, point number one I want us to take note of a little bit more is the threat and uh, as I was thinking uh, through this a little bit, I thought back to um, a story of when our family a few years ago was traveling. We were actually in St. Petersburg, Russia in 2018. And we were, it was a good time to be there then. It was a beautiful city. And uh, we were traveling around. And the people on the bus, we were seeing this uh, amazing church and all this stuff. They warned us uh, that American passports are in hot demand. So they said, leave them on the bus because the pickpocketers are so bad that they, they will go after and find uh, American passports in particular. And if you lose your American passport, it's not the end of the world, but you're in Russia. You go three hours away to Moscow, to the embassy, and have to start, uh, start all over to get back to uh, the cruise ship and eventually back to uh, the United States. So they warned us, so we left our passports on the bus, and we actually saw some pickpocketers wandering through uh, the crowd. And we just happened to, Abigail and I noticed we were walking together, and we were getting annoyed that these people were following kind of closely on us, and we're like, what is with these guys? And then we kind of picked up on, wait a second, I think they're, paying, they're going through looking for the people who aren't paying attention. And they're better at stealing from you than you and I would be at protecting ourselves from being stolen from. And so we saw them a couple places uh, around. I don't know, I don't remember if anybody, uh, I think everybody from our group kept their passports on the bus, but that's what people do spiritually as well. There are spiritual uh, pickpockets, which can, in some ways, Jesus talked about stealing the seed of the word of God out of someone's heart, offering something alternative, false religions, false philosophies that lead people away from Christ that lead people away from truth, that entrap people. There are people who have never put saving faith in Christ and eventually apostatize, walk away from the Lord because they're susceptible to other ideas. But even believers can be misled, especially for a time, by, uh, by different ideas that can lead us astray. And so we're, we're all more vulnerable uh, to this than we think. And so I want us to look at, in verse 8, just these different 
uh, facets of what Paul is talking about is he warns us against uh, philosophy. He warns us against uh, elementary principles of this world. He warns us against traditions of this men uh, of this uh, w- world, traditions of men, rather than according to Christ, who's the foundation of truth. And so I put up here just some. Uh, whoops, I'm trying to click ahead here, but I'm losing my microphone. Should probably turn this on. Well, okay. <laughs> I'm not uh, connecting here. So. Uh, Sarai, could you just click to the next slide for me? Maybe that'll jump it. Okay, there we go. Okay, so here's point one of this, uh, this threat. And I just wanted to talk about what is Paul talking about here with this idea of what is, what is he talking about? He's talking about not being taken captive by philosophy. You don't have to uh, know all this, but just the idea of, of what, what is philosophy? What is he talking about? Should we have, as Christians, nothing to do with philosophy? I mean, what even is it? Or should we, can we appropriate it in some way? Or is it something that is, the Bible tells us to avoid entirely? Well, philosophy is really, uh, the Greek word philosophy comes from a compound word, which means the love of wisdom. And philosophy really has to do with different frameworks or ideas that have to do with uh, these kind of three major areas. Is, you don't have to worry about writing this down just to, for our knowledge, just to show that the Bible speaks on these things. The Bible provides us a biblical philosophy that's according to Christ. And uh, so the first one is epistemology. We all have a theory, whether we think about it a lot or not, or not or of knowledge. How do we know what we know? How do we know truth? How does anyone know truth? Philosophy is dealing with those questions. A lot of people would have lots of different answers to that. Or there's metaphysics in philosophy, which is, what's the theory of reality? How do we know what's real? How do we, what's the nature of reality? What's the substance? Do we know uh, we exist? What does existence mean? What is all, how do we uh, define reality? The Bible speaks to that as well. And then there's the third facet of philosophy, which is ethics. How do we live? What's the authority by which we know right and wrong? How do you know? How can anybody tell anybody else this is right, that is wrong, without it being just something we prefer or make up or want uh, to say or or that we feel like is better than uh, some type of alternative? And so... Philosophy uh, is not bad, it's just it needs to be answered biblically. The, the Christian, in a sense, has to be a philosopher because the foundation of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we love true wisdom and the uh, treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Christ, then everybody is a philosopher. It's just whether or not our philosophy is true. Everyone is a theologian. Everyone has ideas about how they view life, how they view reality, how they view truth, how they view knowledge. And so not only can the Christian engage in philosophy, but the Christian has to. It has to be a biblical philosophy. It has to be a philosophy that is, as it says here, according to Christ. Not looking for alternatives that lead us astray from Christ. And no person, no Christian can avoid philosophy. You may not think real intentionally about it, uh, but we, we all have ideas about how we should live life, what is true, what is the nature of reality. And those ideas will inform how we live. They will inform our worldview. And so the question is not if someone has a philosophy, but what is it? And by what standard is their philosophy based? What is their, the foundation that their philosophy is built on? And Colossians 2, let's see if my clicker works this time. Oh, went backwards. So I can go backwards but not forwards. <laughs> so why could you help me out again? Okay, so our philosophy, our standard, obviously, is what Paul has already said at the beginning of Colossians 2. Our standard is Christ because of all of who Christ is and what he has done. 
Now, this, this is a bold statement that Paul has said. Look at Colossians 2, 1, familiar verses that we've been going over, but this just provides the basis for what Paul is saying about philosophy, and he'll continue to say in verses 8 through 10. He says, For I want you to know the great struggle I have on your behalf, and those who are in Laodicea, those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself. And let me just pause on those words for a minute. What Paul is talking about and what he's adopting the language of is the Greek word for mystery. It's used in the Old Testament. It's used in the New Testament. It doesn't mean like you're solving a mystery like Scooby-Doo, like we figure these things out by putting the clues together. It's that God has worked and spoken in such a way to orient everything around this kind of missing piece that God has to inform us about and make happen, and that's sending Jesus, the God-man, into the world and his work in salvation. That's what he says. Jesus is that unlocking missing piece that makes sense of everything else. And so that's what he's talking about when he says it's the true knowledge of the full understanding of God's mystery, which is Christ. So he says he is the foundation, the substance for knowing truth. And so then he says in verse 3 about Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, the application, I say this so that no one will delude you through persuasive argument or take it, it pickpocket you spiritually, take you captive through philosophy. And so this is the question. This is what we have to ask ourselves if we really share this conviction with Paul that Christ is the source and foundation of all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I mean, do we really believe that? That Jesus is the foundation of everything? That, say it another way, the negative way, you can't know truth without Christ. It's like, wait a second, there are plenty of people around the world who have never heard about Christ. There are plenty of people who don't believe in Jesus, who have done some amazing things, scientifically, contributions, they've learned amazing things. But if Jesus is who Paul says he is, God the creator, in whom all things hold together, the head of all things, then he has to be the foundation of knowledge. He provides the foundation, because he's God, of what is knowledge, what is truth, what is reality, and that apart from Jesus as God, we can't know truth. That even if people haven't heard of Jesus, Jesus is the creator who has created and sustained and revealed uh, himself through his creation. And therefore to think, to reason, to use logic, to do science, to judge what is right, to judge what is wrong. All people know God. They know Christ in that sense. They may not come to know him in a saving way. They need the gospel the saving work of Christ to know that. But Jesus is the foundation, according to Paul, of all truth, all wisdom, and all knowledge. And what happens to other philosophies is if you consistently apply what they're saying, they self-destruct. It's not just that they contradict the Bible. That's true. It's that they will eventually contradict and fall apart under their own weight. They are inconsistent, they're arbitrary, because they don't have that core foundation of truth that's in Christ. And so the conviction that Paul has, is that tr- and that we should have, is that truth, knowledge, wisdom do not exist independent of Jesus. That's, that's a bold statement. If you said that today on a college campus, on the news... It doesn't matter if it's CNN or Fox. I mean, it matters to a degree, but really you just have to say you, truth is founded on the person of who Jesus is. I mean, that would be crazy talk. But if we understand who Jesus is, Jesus is the creator, that he's the God-man come in the flesh as Jesus of Nazareth. He's the one that provides the possibility to even know truth in this world in the first place then all roads lead to Christ as far as knowledge, wisdom, and truth are concerned. And so that has to be the the conviction 
of the Christian. It's not that just Jesus saved us, but that Jesus uh, has reoriented how we see everything, reoriented how uh, we see the world. Uh, And so Paul warns here, see to it that nobody steals from you by these artificial substitutes, by philosophy, by empty deception, by the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of this world, rather than according to Christ, that they don't have anything else to offer. It's a poor substitute at best that that leads away or distracts from the truth. And without presupposing God revealed in Christ as the creator, in whom all things are held together, knowledge becomes impossible. And so Paul wants to reorient the thinking of the Colossians to believe that. And once you believe that, you won't be taken captive by philosophy because you'll know that the philosophies of this world, the philosophies, the inventions of man's mind have nothing to offer as far as their substance uh, besides what Christ offers. And so they, they cannot Uh, sustain themselves. They cannot uh, provide truth, wisdom, and knowledge that Christ provides. And by the way, even in a bigger sense, they can't provide salvation. Jesus not only gives us a foundation for truth, but he also is the Savior who has entered this world on a mission of mercy to save his people from their sins. (laughs) I wrote a paper when I was in my first year of college Uh, It was a philosophy paper, and I chose this text. And I would probably express some things in a different way than I did uh, back then. Not that I would, you know, change uh, the the foundation, but just to kind of make the different way we said it. We had to present it in class, and so the teacher, you know, had kind of a back and forth with me. He was a nice guy, but I wasn't a believer. And so when I said that, you know, philosophy is really about, you know, it's all about Christ, uh, you know, that was uh, an interesting discussion to have. But anyway, so then we had to present, talk about our papers before the class. And uh, I did like the one thing I said at the end that was, I said, well, you know what, look, all these philosophers, whatever they have said and whatever you may say about them, none of them died for you. And so, and everyone in the class was kind of like, oh, I guess that's kind of true. And so, I mean, but that's the, that is the case. Jesus didn't just come as a, as a Socrates and say a bunch of stuff that Jesus came as the God man to save his people from their sins, to produce uh, the kingdom of God that he's the king of and that everything orients uh, around him. Right, as Paul talks about, well, not Paul, maybe Paul in, in Hebrews 1, uh, he says that a God, after he spoke in the prophets, many portions, many ways, all through revelational history that God has been working and speaking, has caused it all to fall on. Now he speaks to us in these last days in his Son, by whom he made the world, in whom are the ages. Jesus is head over all of these things. And so the alternatives, basically, to this, and I've said these the kind of three alternatives, are if you push human knowledge, human ideas, whether it's another religion, another philosophy, here are the options. They come back to a world of chance chaos, where we develop our ideas, our worldview, from a worldview of chance chaos. In that case, there is no truth, there is no sin, there is no righteousness, there is no moral relevance, there is no scientific method, there's no logic, there's no understanding. A chance chaos would not get us to truth. That's the, one of the alternatives. Or it's human opinion. If you continue to push back on what people believe and why, it comes down to, well, it's my, my preference. I think this would be better than that. Or it's, I think this is true, not that. And so it comes down to a human opinion. If neither of those supply a foundation for knowledge, all we're left with is Christ. Is God revealed in Christ, revealing himself in the scriptures? The alternatives cannot provide a foundation of knowledge. Only Jesus can. And so that's why Paul is trying to convince uh, the Colossians of what is true, that it is based in Christ 
And then he's going to, as we'll see, he's going to say, and you're in him, and in him, you're already complete. You're already full. He already provided a full salvation, a new heart, all these things for the saving of the soul, but he also provides a foundation for the knowledge of truth. That there's, you don't, you're not missing out on something else outside of Christ, is what Paul will, will get at as he details here our union with Christ. And so I'm going to uh, skip ahead to just a, a quote here that I wanted to share with you. See if I'm able to skip ahead. I can, I can only seem to start this thing over. <laughs> you know, there's that line about the pastor gets distracted and he's like, where was I? I'll just start from the beginning. <laughs> uh, Sarai, could you get me to the... <laughs> I'm going to skip uh, ahead a little bit to the one that has a, a quote on there. And you've got Sarai going, bouncing back and forth now too. <laughs> but, uh, can you skip ahead of that one? Okay, um, this is just a quote from a great uh, apologist who just really, I think, got this idea that of why the Bible is the ultimate authority, why the word of God, the word of Christ is the ultimate authority. And he says, the Bible is thought of, because it's the word of God, as the authoritative on everything of which it speaks. Moreover, it speaks of everything. So a lot of times people say, well, of course, there's truth outside the Bible that you can know. The Bible's not a math textbook. The Bible's not a Chilton manual for fixing a car or something like that. And that's true. There is information. There is facts and things that we understand in the world. However, you still have to have a foundation for understanding what it is you're doing when you're fixing a car, when you're baking a cake, when you're uh, doing a math problem. You have to have a biblical foundation of uh, knowledge for that to be possible in the first place. Therefore, the Bible and Christ do provide that foundation for everything that we, uh, that we do, every thought that we think. He goes on, he says, we do not mean that it speaks of football games, of atoms, uh, etc. directly, but we do mean that it speaks of everything either directly or by implication. It not only tells us, it tells us not only of Christ and his saving work, but he also tells us uh, about, tells us who God is, where the universe uh, came from, tells us about theism and about Christianity, tells us not only that there is a God who created this world, but the saving work of God in Christ as he sent Jesus to die on the cross and raise, rise from the grave. He says, it gives us a philosophy of history as well as history. Moreover, the information on these subjects is woven into an inextricable whole, and it is only if you reject the Bible as the word of God that you can separate so, the so-called religious and moral instruction of the Bible from what it says about the physical universe. Meaning the Bible provides a foundation of uh, the knowledge of uh, everything because of who God is as creator, Therefore, it has to be authoritative on everything that it speaks about. That as you and I are working or fixing something or solving a math problem or whatever the case is, underlying that is a foundation that God has created the world, that he upholds it in a stable way that we're able to interact in it, and that he is, the, uh, is sustaining it in a way that we are able to participate with this world in uh, in a way that's meaningful. You don't have that. You lose a foundation for knowledge. Only the Bible provides that. Only Christ uh, provides that foundation of knowledge. I just wanted to give a few um, as we continue to look at this, kind of what Paul uh, identifies this by philosophy, empty deception, tradition, elementary principles. He doesn't give us an exhaustive list here in Colossians 2.8, but I wanted to just offer a few pickpockets, spiritual pickpockets that we might be vulnerable to. That I think that, you know, I don't, I doubt that anybody here is going to uh, become uh, a Marxist or follow the critical race theory, but I think we're more susceptible to uh, some other philosophies and so I've made a kind of a, a listing of, of just some things that I think that we might be more uh, prone to. Some questions just for us to think about, maybe to discuss in care groups. As we think about the foundation of Christ as the uh, 
all the foundation of wisdom and knowledge, but just being asked, you know, asking ourselves, which is a little hard to identify, have we been deluded by any persuasive arguments? Maybe not right now, but maybe you can identify a time in the past. Uh, do you believe that there are independent or neutral so-called areas that do have nothing to do with Jesus or the Bible? That, okay, as far as the Bible's concerned, yeah, that's about the gospel, salvation of my soul, worshiping God, okay. But when it comes over here, this area doesn't really have anything to do with God, anything to do with Christ, anything to do with uh, the Bible. The Bible doesn't inform, therefore, um, it's outside, it's, it's independent from God. There's a temptation to think uh, of that, um, that there's a neutrality. Uh, have our thoughts been captured in some way? And then I think the, the way I, I want to put this is uh, that I've been thinking about recently is this, uh, this statement. Am I seeking to conform a thought or idea to obedience to Jesus and his word, or am I trying to bend or incorporate Jesus and his word around a thought or idea? What I'm saying is it's very easy. You can make the Bible a grab bag and say, you know, different things out of context to try to artificially, I um, mean superficially, back up what we want to be true. But that's not having God communicate to us and submit to what God uh, reveals to be true. So am I trying to bend the Bible and Jesus around an idea that I have some attachment or loyalty to? Or am I taking an idea and saying, is this true according to what God says? What does God say on this or related to this? How is this in obedience or disobedience to Christ? How can I conform this into obedience to Christ? And so I think that idea of are we bending ideas around uh, or bending uh, Christ and the Bible around ideas that we want to try to make uh, biblical in some way, or are we taking uh, truth and applying it as a framework to judge everything else? Um, some others that I just listed quickly um, are the, the myth of neutrality, which I mentioned, the idea that here's what God commands, here's evil, that there's this middle area that is neither loyal to one side or the other, and that you can kind of go in here and judge for yourself what is true, what is right, and that God doesn't really have anything to say on this middle area of neutrality. I think the most common uh, way that that, that has shown up is it's, uh, in our culture is we've seen that with regard to things like schooling and education. The idea for a long time that, uh, that institutions not loyal to Christ uh, or the scriptures, well, they, you know, they'll just teach the, the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, um, and now only coming out later when it's like high-handed sexual immorality and a naturalistic view of origins, things of that nature, do we see, wait a second, that's not neutral. That's, that, those are value commitments. Those are philosophies. Those are ideas having to do with your idea of what is true. So there's not just this idea where we get to be uh, neutral and decide on what is uh, true or right, independent of what God has said. Another one is, uh, I put secularism or worldliness, just the trying to be like the world or establishing worldly goals. And this doesn't mean like you're trying to be cool necessarily, but I think just adopting worldly ways of thinking is something that we can uh, be prone to, that we repeat these elementary principles of the world uh, very often. Uh, another one uh, is dualism. I'm not talking about this ancient Greek dualism here. I'm talking about that Somebody's a Christian, they go to church, that's their worship of Jesus on Sunday. Monday through Saturday is a secular life that doesn't have much to do with God. Not that they're doing things that are really bad, it's just that there's no thought of God. God's just absent from that area of life. That's a, it's a dualism, very common uh, in our culture, or syncretism, blending together biblical truth with unbiblical ideas or systems. Um, another one that I put here was, I call it uh, soul-stealing busyness. And I, I've gotten this from, you know, it talks about, and Jesus talks about in uh, Luke 8, 14, that the word goes out like seed and that there's these thorns, these weeds that choke. 
it out. And Jesus says, that's the anxieties, that's the cares, that's the busyness of this life, that somebody's heard the word of God, had some conviction or response to it, but it just gets crowded out by just the busyness. And I think that's one that uh, we can all tend to be very prone to. Um, and I think we have to be very careful, uh, I think of, uh, think of Awana, of, of talking about, even if it's true, how, how busy we all are as families. Uh, because I'll tell you, there are kids who come week in and week out who will uh, learn very early to say that they're too busy to learn a Bible verse, too busy to be in the Word of God. And uh, you, you all know that it, uh, at 8 uh, to verses 40, you're going to get more busy as you grow up. You know, you're not, you didn't hit peak busyness when you were 8. And, <laughs> and you know, it's like, wow, I got those, you know, bills to pay, wash the car. Yeah. Um, but truly, like it's kids learn at a very early age to to repeat, um, and without somebody actively doing something that's wrong, just to repeat. Yeah, I'm too busy. I'm too busy for uh, God's word. And, and just as another note, uh, kids will go through in general uh, from six to eighteen years old twenty thousand hours of uh, secular education and discipleship in their school career. Uh, coming on Sunday morning and singing only a boy named David or gluing a cotton ball to the little sheep in Sunday school is not going to be enough to compete with 20,000 hours of discipleship just from one source. But that's just education. Think of You could think of uh, social media, different things, that, all these uh, influences that anybody, not just kids, could be getting. Um, and that ties in, I think, with, uh, with the Mother's Day um, theme is that, it's, you know, the idea of that mothers have a key role, as do fathers, of teaching their children uh, in truth and modeling uh, truth for their children. Um, Deuteronomy 6 talks about the greatest commandment to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then ties that to you shall teach these to your children diligently so that these words may be on your heart. And so you can't guarantee that your kids will get saved through hearing the word of God. It's not a recipe. That being said, you can, I don't think anybody can come to love God without knowing the word of God, knowing who God is. Um, and you can't know that without his word. Uh, worldly goals is another one. You know, what, what do we want for ourselves? What do you want for children? Uh, another one I put here is uh, what I call uh, Christless conservatism. That uh, this is uh, people who recognize some of the craziness going on in our culture, um, but they don't identify it from a biblical worldview. And if you push back what their authority system is, they believe in objective truth. They believe in objective values. But what their authority is, is usually tradition or utilitarianism, meaning we, it, we, I feel like this is better for society than that. That's not authoritative, that's just somebody's uh, opinion or man's reason. And so this is why the, you know, the things, uh, there's nothing wrong with this as far as an internal critique goes, but like a, the What is a Woman movie, uh, yeah, it's good at saying, okay, it's foolish to say uh, anyone can be a woman, what is a woman, nobody knows, right? Okay, we got that, that's a, that's a solid critique to make, but then if it doesn't call people to uh, Christ, who goes back to God's word and says that God defines these things and it requires uh, a switch of loyalty and repentance, then really you're just calling someone to switch from one cultural preference to another. Right? That's the problem with uh, this kind of this Christless uh, conservatism. So those people need the Lord. They're operating from a different authority. I think or just a general uh, lack of uh, biblical worldview of applying God's word to all areas of life. And uh, that's, uh, there's some research that shows that the incidence in churches in America, biblical worldview is very low, um, even among pastors, even among uh, youth pastors. And so those are some threats. But now Paul goes on and says, and we're going to look at this, uh, this next point, and saying, you know, how can he possibly uh, say this about Jesus? It's a foundation of all of these things. 
He's, that everything needs to be according to Christ, that there's not truth, wisdom, knowledge outside of him? Well, that gets us to uh, why is Christ the source and the standard for all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge? And if you look at verse 9, that's because he's God, very simply. Uh, look at verse 9, and uh, Sarai, could you uh, fast forward a few uh, Perfect. Thank you. This will deal with a, an issue that Paul is dealing with. Look at verse 9. How can you possibly say this about Jesus of Nazareth who lived 2,000 years ago? Because, Colossians 2.9, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. It's a great verse that summarizes that Jesus is the God-man. So point number two is that it's the nature of Christ that makes him the foundation it's that he's the God-man. He's the only uh, person, the only being who is, who is this. And this is a simple but amazing verse that gets all of the points of that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And if he is that and he is the creator, then there is no alternative for truth, for wisdom, for knowledge, for salvation. That it all goes into Jesus. And so Paul uh, says this, and this is a great verse for if you have those people come and knocking on your door, the Jehovah's Witnesses, instead of hiding between the cou- behind the couch, you could open the door, but you'll probably be tempted because the Jehovah's Witnesses don't uh, believe Jesus is God, and they, uh, you would go to John 1.1, 1, 1, which is a great verse. But they have a little statement that they always say about John 1.1, 1, 1, so they won't listen if you go there. But where you could go is Colossians 2.9, which Paul is saying, in him, in Christ, all the fullness of deity, the Greek word here, deity, is theotetos, which means that which makes God, God, all of that dwells in Jesus in bodily form. So therefore, Jesus is fully God, fully man. Very simple uh, statement. What Paul was dealing with was a heresy during this time of these early Gnostics who were saying, they used words like God and Jesus and other stuff, but this is what they meant. This is why I put this on, uh, on the screen. It's a little hard to see. By God, they called it the pleroma. It's a Greek word for fullness. Okay, so they said there's this God who's really far away, who has nothing to do with this world, who's this big fullness the play Roma, and that because like the sun emanates light, there's these offshoots from him that shoot off other stuff called aeons or emanations. And they say there's a bad one of those called the demiurge, and he created the world, the physical world, and he's the mean God of the Old Testament. But there's a nice semi-God who emanated from the fullness, and that's who we identify as Jesus. He's not God fully, but he doesn't have a body. He's just one of the emanations of the fullness of this being. Right? So that's what they were saying. And this is the heresy that the Colossians are saying, I don't know that about Jesus. I've never heard that. That's not true. And they, the Gnostics, they say, where are you getting that from? They would say, it's a secret tradition that the apostles didn't write down, they didn't reveal in their preaching. They reviewed, uh, revealed it to a few people who were smart enough to get it, who had the true knowledge, which were the Gnostics. So the, the first time, by the way, and historians have studied this out, that arguments for doctrine from tradition in church history was not the Roman Catholics, it was Gnostics. They would say, where did this come from? I haven't heard this. This wasn't in the preaching of Jesus. This wasn't in any of the churches. This isn't what John or Paul or Peter has written down. They'd say, it's a secret tradition. They gave it to us. They didn't give it to you. We know what it is. We'll tell you what it is. This is who God really is. You know, he's, this, the bad God of the Old Testament created the world. He's a demiurge. Jesus is an emanation. And so Paul uses their language against them in Colossians 2.9. And says, no, that's a dumb philosophy that's trying to pickpocket you. Colossians 2.9, in him, all the fullness, he uses the word pleroma, the fullness, that you can't get any fuller than the fullness, 
of deity dwells in bodily form. So he says, all that God is, is in Christ in a bodily form. Jesus is the God-man. So Paul says, no, no, no. You think that there's this distant fullness. He says, no, Jesus is the fullness. And he says that uh, this all dwells in him. You can't get any fuller. There's not this outside stuff outside of Jesus, that he is fully God and fully man. And so therefore, worldly philosophy, so-called apostolic tradition that's not according to what the apostles taught and wrote down, and basic worldly thinking are just a bunch of nonsense because it's not tied back to Jesus in whom is the fullness Paul's saying basically, why are you looking for more outside of the fullness, right? There's, you don't get more than the fullness. And so there is, Paul is firm uh, on this ground that true knowledge and all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ alone. That there is no knowledge outside of Christ that because Jesus is God in bodily form, And since Jesus is God, the sovereign, uncreated creator, as Colossians 1 talks about, and he's the head over all things, both physical and spiritual, meaning he's head over the creation and he's also head over the church, then all the fullness dwells in him, then there is no truth, knowledge, or wisdom that's independent of Jesus. You don't have to go looking for something else. You don't have to worry that you missed out on something, that there's this missing truth that's outside of Christ. And so Paul uh, uses that language against them, against the Gnostic heresy, but to encourage the believers not to be taken captive by these ideas. And therefore, look at verse 10. He, He encourages them now with this great truth. In verse 10, this third point here, that they are complete in Christ. That because of the threat philosophy, worldly tradition, rather than according to Christ. Because Jesus is God, he's the fullness of God in, in bodily form. You don't, you're not missing out on something outside of him. And if you are in Christ, you are united to him, it says in verse 10, and in him you have been made complete. The uh, translation here is actually Jesus in verse 9 is the fullness, and in 2.10, Paul says, and in him you have been made full. That you are already, if you're a believer, complete in Christ. You're not lacking anything necessary for your salvation, for truth, for being right before God, for, for knowledge, for anything else. You're already, if you're a believer, complete in Christ. And then you'll say here, and he is the head over all rule and all authority. That it's in Jesus, not only truth, but value actually meet. That he's the one that defines, he's the one that's in charge of everything. He's the one that is the authoritative head over all rule and all authority. Not only because he's God, but because as the God man, he accomplished this unique work for God, for our salvation, in saving his people, that he is the head over all spiritual authority as well. He's the head over the church, and we get to be uh, connected with him. This is, is such an amazing truth of the gospel, is that, you know, who could really complain if God just forgave our sins just didn't punish us and but had nothing to do with us, put us on some just distant planet and just didn't deal with us. But it's not only that God pulled us into relationship with him if you're saved, but that God united us to Christ so that everything he has, all his fullness, now uh, accrues to us, belongs to us in Christ. That he took on our sin, that we take on his Righteousness, that we're united to him. That God provided such a full, uh, amazing salvation in Christ. And in him, we are complete. And Paul is going to, he does not, as Paul often does, he does not end the sentence there. Paul likes his long sentences because he gets going and he can't, 
<laughs> can't stop. Uh, so he's the master of the, the comma and the semicolon. He's going to elaborate through here. Yes, you're complete in Christ because he's the fullness. And he's going to elaborate what that means for our salvation. And we're going to look at that, that those aspects of union with Christ uh, next week. Okay. The next week, we'll look at verses uh, 10 through 12, as Paul unfolds that because if you are in Christ, this is what he did, that no other philosophy, no other being, no other idea, no other tradition can provide, that we're united with him in his death, resurrection, that he provided such a full forgiveness of sins, a new heart, a new standing before God, that in him, uh, that we are totally complete. Take note of, over the next week, all the times, you can, just in Colossians 2, but you could explore the rest of the book, all the times it talks about in him, in Christ. That this is, I think, an underappreciated aspect of uh, God's work in salvation that is actually, I, I mean, I was realizing over the last year, it's all over the place. This is definitive to uh, the, the biblical gospel. Is It's not just when Jesus died on the cross, he forgave my sins. It's that Paul, uh, that, that God identifies us as dying with Christ, rising with Christ, all of what he has becoming ours, being complete in Christ. And so we will have to put a pin uh, in this, we, which was planned. It wasn't, uh, I'm not just calling an audible, but, <laughs> but we can be thinking about over the, the next week, there are aspects of that union with Christ, but also asking ourselves, do we really bone deep convictionally believe that Christ is the foundation of all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge? And that this is the, you know, we preach against here the uh, superficial health, wealth, prosperity gospel because it's wrong, because it's a lie, it's not biblical truth, but that's because this is the real wealth, prosperity gospel, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of, the, of being in Christ. It said, if you go after the substitute, you miss the real wealth of the real thing, which is being complete uh, in Christ. And so we, Paul warns not to get robbed of that, not to get spiritually uh, pickpocketed. But uh, let's uh, close in prayer, and we will uh, return to this great topic next week. Lord God, we thank you for this great truth that you have sent us a great Savior, Lord, and that you would not send us such a great Savior and then uh, have us be restrained from worshiping him, that we have in Christ died with him, that we will live uh, with him, that our sins are forgiven, that you have united us to your Son in a unique way, Lord, that as it says in uh, John 6, to whom else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. Lord, that there is, no, uh, there is no one else, there is no other uh, name under heaven by which we must be saved which, except the name of Christ, Lord, uh, that he not only saves us from our sins, uh, but that he provides a foundation for true knowledge in all things, Lord. I pray that we'd be uh, rooted and grounded with that knowledge of being complete in Christ, Lord. It's in his name we pray. Amen.